welcome back to our discussion episode. Last time we created a character group for Dungeons and Dragons. This episode we will be discussing the character creation process. Neil Tosquell, welcome back. Hey, we made Yay! it. Yay! <laughs> uh, could you go ahead and introduce yourselves again for everyone at home and tell us a little bit about the character that we made uh, last episode? Um, how about Tosquell? You want to start us off? Sure, yeah, I am Tall Squall. You can find me around the internet on several different RPG uh, things that are going on, including uh, Turn Cloaks Podcast, uh, a uh, game that I DM for called The Vice that we do 100% for charity on Saturdays at 2 o'clock, Learn by Play on Saturday nights over on the D&D channel, and uh, also on some other things that Encounter Roleplay does throughout the week. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, last week I made a, uh, good old fashioned fighter, uh, named, uh, Valjan Hammerfall. Uh, and, uh, he is, uh, the probably great, great, if not great, 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 uh, nephew of, uh, <laughs> our good buddy over here who we are going to hear all about. I forget your character's name. Tasgrax. Tasgrax, uh, who is our cleric of the group. So uh, it's going to be interesting as we uh, get into their dynamic. That's a good segue over to you, Neil. Yes, so I am Neil. It's weird to not forcibly say DM Neil, a.k.a. Joke Maniac. And I've said that probably hundreds of times. And now 101. (laughs) Yes. So if you head over to Twitter, you can go to at DMS underscore block. That's at DMs block where I help with the Dungeon Masters block and uh, words and stuff to tie it back directly to Tallsquell and the encounter roleplay thing that I am involved in. Head over and check out at Tentacles Pod to get terrified um, by a Call of Cthulhu game that's coming out from Encounter Roleplay. And I made Tazgrax Hammerfall, the very, not very old, but certainly well in his years, dwarf cleric who is taking the young whippersnapper with him and hopefully they can learn from each other. And along the way, they met with Jaren Feldspar, my character, who is a human monk um, training at the Temple of Lathander. And he had been held back by his superiors uh, more than he was willing to accept and found an opportunity to go on an adventure with these two dwarves that were headed out uh, to make a name for themselves. So he got out of Dodge at the first opportunity that availed him. Um, And uh, following along with them is uh, Tess Greenleaf, who is a half-elf bard. Um, who is known for some less than reputable sales tactics um, and is uh, on the wrong side of some people and trying to get out of town and found this this adventuring group and decided this was the best bet for running away from her problems. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, definitely a, a nice motley crew of uh, adventurers. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do great things here. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are gonna go ahead and jump right into our our segment. Um, we are calling D twenty for your thoughts. D twenty for your thoughts. Um, so in this segment, we're gonna go through our thoughts about the creation process and how it feels compared to some other systems that we've played. Yeah, so uh, first, let's go ahead and discuss your personal process for picking and creating a character in, it doesn't have to be D- Dungeons and Dragons, but any sort of role-playing system. What's what's your general go-to for figuring out how to make a character? Uh, let's go with uh, Tosqual first. Uh, for me, uh, like I said, I mean, there's always sort of a little spark of inspiration, and I sort of had two different things that uh, sort of came into mind as I was thinking about this uh, little project that we're doing. One was, uh, you know, people who are just starting out, giving them something that uh, is a mechanically fairly easy class to play, especially if you're new to uh, D&D. But then also the fact that um, you have that ability to create a story around it. And for me, the fighter was one of those things that you really can build a story because the mechanics that are 
the growth mechanic to your um, characteristics that's already built into the class itself. Um, on the other side of that, uh, I was listening to D&D videos and uh, Mike Merles just did his piece on dwarves. And uh, so I was kind of interested in, hey, let me go, go down that route of this young dwarf wanting to be a fighter, uh, trying to hone his skills, learn his craft and uh, see how it takes him out into the world and that everything that he's going to do. So for me, uh, you know, I always kind of, before I even really get into a character building place where you're getting into the roles and and everything else, I usually try to start with that story. What is a story that I haven't told before that I'd like to tell? Um, You know, uh, for this one, I I went through it a little bit, but I mean, one of the characters I just had to create right before this was my new character for Learn by Play, which is uh, Miguel. Um, and I always like to play the healer. A lot of people don't. So I wanted to try something new. But having people know a couple of the other healers that I've played in other various games, uh, Gavin over on a counter role play, Alistair in turn cloaks, I wanted to make something really unique and different. So, um, you know, went with the new warlock class, uh, as a just, oh, I want to try something different to make this different. And then it was like, how do I not have just another one of, you know, Jay's hope filled, uh, or <laughs> hope filled in Gavin's case, downtrodden in, you know, uh, in Alistair's case, you know, healers. And so, um, I just started, you know, okay, so what's this class all about? You know, know a little bit about what you're getting yourself into. You know, as I said, the young dwarf came from the fact that the fighter class had this mechanic that instead of every four levels gaining a um, an attribute, a bonus to attribute scores, they get it every two level. So to me, that was like, okay, here is obviously a class that's about showing growth. So let's make him a kid. Let's make him a dwarf that we just found that I just, you know, sort of learned about how their whole religion and culture is about, you know, becoming masterful at their skills, whether it's, you know, weapons or whatever else. Um, so once I picked this celestial warlock who has a patron who is a celestial creature, you know, I started researching, well, what are some cool celestial creatures that we can go with? Um, you know, did. Do my D and D Beyond pitch? Did the monsters and cert- and filtered by celestials, and there aren't a whole lot of them, uh, but one of them <laughs> happens to be uh, a Kotal, which is sort of this you know this very uh, you know this rainbow serpent, which you know has a lot of mythos in uh, the Mesoamerican cultures, and so I was able to pull on that. So maybe you know, he's this Mesoamerican uh, you know culture. Um, of this rainbow serpent and having played Alistair, who's sort of my crow who is, you know, sort of whites and blacks. And even Gavin is very sort of, um, you know, is a blacksmith and sort of down to earth. Let's play on this rainbow serpent. And so I have this very uh, charismatic, very um, uh, colorful character, you know, by just sort of starting to just pull these pieces together. I mean, that's sort of how I've always built characters to give them some realism, not only in my mind and in my story, but realism in based in the mechanics of the game itself. Because I think that's what makes it intriguing for other people who are fans of the game or fans of different um, systems, is that it's not that you're just going, hey, uh, this is this guy. It's the, no, I've pulled on these things that are known mechanics or mechanical things in the game, you know, uh, and expounded on them and turned them and tried to weave them into a story. So, you know, and once you start going down those paths, it's pretty easy. I was like, well, so what, ra- you know, then get into what race is he? Well, let's really hit home this whole thing about the rainbow serpent. He's an Azimar. And so his patron and his blood come from this same rainbow serpent. So that you, 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 you've got this sort of double tie in with who he is and where he comes from and where his powers come from. So, you know, we were talking about your races, kind of who you are, your class is your job. His race and class are aligned. So I, I had this sort of birthright piece that I was able to pull into his story. And you, know, you just sort of keep 
expounding. And you know, there's so many great resources, whether it's Google, whether it's D&D Beyond, whatever, to just keep putting these layers one by one until suddenly you have this fully realized character. That's very cool. So that's sort of my process. And what about you, Neil? Um, I pick a dwarf and <laughs> I kind of go from there. <laughs> do you no, always I, pick a dwarf? <laughs> do you just like, uh, I'm not gonna lie. If I can, I do. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's just, I think for me, it's just for it, it really depends on the length that the game will go as to what I will, what I will choose in my process. Cause if it's a one shot, I am most assuredly going to stretch myself more than I would for something that's a campaign and kind of kind of go back to like that comfort food of the dwarf cleric or something akin to that, no matter what the system is. And I think that's just, it just puts me in a more comfortable place to more easily role play. But then, like I said, for one shots, I go way out there um, to, to stretch and be able to do kind of different things. But again, pretty much dwarf. <laughs> do you like to pick the, the mechanical parts of it first and then kind of decide how your background fits into that or do you like to kind of have a story first and then say these are the mechanics that make that possible in the game i definitely like choosing some options before starting to do the mechanics so and i am i am definitely a sucker for playing off of what other people come up with more so than really coming up with anything myself i i just get more personal enjoyment out of that and folding my ideas into what other people are passionate about and i think that definitely comes from years and years of being a dm that that's kind of what you do you bold face lie and be like yeah that's totally what i came up with man their idea was way better than mine <laughs> But I think that's kind of where it comes from for me. For you, Tall Squall, it sounded like you kind of layer those things in between and, you know, like do them both at the same time. Or are you usually kind of picking a personality and a story? Uh, usually, I mean, it's just it's I think it's just that it's layer upon layer. And then um, as I even did with the character creation of Valjan, very often I am mixing and matching background. Um, you know, uh, you know, as I said, I sort of got to this whole place after following down this path to, okay, this is this birthright thing that he, you know, he was born to be this speaker for this, you know, um, this celestial that is be that's worshiped by his, uh, by his community, by his culture. Um, and so I sort of, you know, went down there. And so, you know, I pulled some pieces from Acolyte, which was kind of working for that, but then also from Entertainer, because I see this very much as a um, very presentational culture and lots of war paint, lots of dances, lots of things like that that are done in their ceremonies. So it, he needed to be proficient in that. So I was able to sort of blend this idea of a, uh, you know, I went out on Google and started looking into Aztecs and Mayans and some of the Mesoamerican cultures of the way that they, you know, worshipped the, some of their ceremonies. Uh, they, a lot of it was through sport. A lot of it was through, I mean, sacrifices. A lot of it was through, you know, these, you know, headdresses and ornate armors and things like that. And so I was able to layer some of that in to then create this background for him. Again, a custom background, but sort of this blend of the acolyte and entertainer, but in a much more ceremonial piece. I mean, and I even went with, as the tool, a disguise kit, but it's not a disguise kit like you think of for a rogue. It's actually more like war paints and, you know, it's a presentational, you know, ceremonial kit than necessarily like a disguise kit. So it's a disguise kit that uses his charisma to you, a charisma piece uh, for a tool test on it. So that's where you get into some of this home brewery that you kind of need to do sometimes to tell the story that you want to tell. Um, always get with your DM, always make sure that that works, but um, don't be afraid. Don't think that you have to just use one of the canned pieces there. 
they're great. They're wonderful. In fact, some of my greatest one shots I've done have been doing the the true random. I mean, you know, I've, I've been sitting here clicking on the random <laughs> character just because, like, oh wow, that's cool. Maybe I could do that that's later. Really cool. There's also a fun little some by some site out there which um, is uh, you know that do the same thing. It'll give you sort of a random piece. Um, Numenera has a great system like that, which is basically it's a sentence um, and I'm going to get it wrong because I always get it wrong, but it is, I'm a, this that does this and likes that, you know, it's this, you build this sentence of putting the different pieces into it. And it's, uh, it's a really interesting way of just sort of coming up with that. Okay. That's telling you who you are. Yeah, that one, the Cypher system uses that really cool sentence because I know that um, they have the No Thank You Evil is their kids version and it's I am a blank that does blank and then has blank or something like that. Um, And it's it's super fun to just kind of build your story off of something so simple like that Mm -hmm. um, and just see how that, you know, kind of unfolds as you move forward and make continually more choices in the process. Yeah, no, um, yeah, Cypher system is great for, for that quickly getting you there. Yeah, I just want to get all the right words. You know, it's type, a type, a descriptor, and a focus. And there you go. And you're done. You're ready. You know, you're, you're, that, that explains who your character is. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, cause you've got a lot more control in, uh, like D and D and Cypher system to, kind of really hone in on who your character is and then um while i've been trying to work on my own game uh chimera uh it uses the powered by the apocalypse engine and that one is you've got kind of like an archetype playbook but you can you can just take one of those in in most of the powered by apocalypse games and insert your own details as needed that's kind of outside of the mechanics of character creation because uh, most of the playbooks from what I've seen are very generic. Like you get these sort of things to choose from, you get to make up pretty much everything else about your character. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit uh, on the side of the official character creation process from the experience I've had with it, which is kind of an interesting and different approach to character design. So Neil, I want to I want to start with you on this one and just ask, how do you feel like this one stacks up to other things that you've played? Do you like doing it this way better, where you kind of go through that process and go choice A and then move on to B, like you kind of move your way down the list, or are there other systems that you feel like do this process better? I think, and, and I've was always wondering where this kind of idea that I had would fit in. But I think that D and D stacks up kind of head and shoulders above other systems in the versatility in approach. Um, Kind of with that is the idea that it's been around for 40 years. So the crazy homebrew style customizations that you can hear about and like the way people approach it at every single table is different. So I think it, like the character creation process can still feel new no matter where you go. Cause like I have personal stuff that I make my players do that maybe other people do. I actually force them to, and I say force because they kind of don't want to, but I say too bad, um, <laughs> to actually roll on the NPC trait table in the 3.5 Dungeon Master's Guide. And those aren't good, <laughs> always. So we had a <laughs> We had one game where we had a sweaty half orc paladin and like it constantly came up that like anytime he would fail like a climb check that it's just like, oh my gosh, if you weren't so sweaty, you, you would have been able to do it. <laughs> um, so just like the ability to have those customizations and you know, I mean, like tall squall bringing up like really digging in and finding the exact pieces and parts of your background that you want to use. Uh, and you're in just so many different ways to approach it that I think um, not every system has because you know, and they just haven't been around quite as long. Yeah. Tall Squall, do you feel like that's about right? Like it stacks up above other ones? Or do you think that there are things that it could do better? There is certainly uh, 
other systems that can be just as agile. But I would agree that the big thing with not even just 5th edition, but the entire breadth of Dungeons & Dragons is that you're able to um, most anything that you want to create, there is an example or a way someone's been, someone's thought of it, been there, can give you a hand or have help you with finding the pieces to put together exactly you want. Uh, you know, like I said, I'm not an expert at all on the Forgotten Realms. I mean, I, I literally went on my Twitter and was like, okay, so is there like a Mesoamerican equivalent to, uh, you know, continent in Forgotten Realms? And within 30 seconds, I had someone, oh, yeah, it's called Mazteca and it's this place. And here's a wiki article you can go read. And I'm like, it, it was. <laughs> it's this great blend of a lot of these South American cultures um, where I was able, you know, it's where Tabaxi come from. I didn't know that. So there's this whole piece that I got to pull into that, oh, okay, so – you know, how does that work? That here is, you know, here's this uh, Azamar that is, you know, in this sort of, does he get along with Tabaxi? Does he not? And lo and behold, it came, literally came up in our first session. It's like, okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think that's now. one of the, the great things about it is, you know, there are such great detailed maps and cultures and resources for just about everything. I mean, if you want to, you know, even if you want to take something from your homebrew world and bring it into, you know, a module, you usually can do it pretty easily. Do you think that that's um, because of the system lends itself well to that? Or do you think that more of that is because it's just been around so long that we've had so much time to build these things? I think a little bit of both. Or a little bit of both. I think it's a little <laughs> bit of both. And I think 5th edition has really tried to allow you to capitalize that on more. And I didn't play fourth, but uh, from everything I hear about fourth, fourth got very how to play a video game on your tabletop um, mechanically, which, I mean, let's face it, there's a reason to use a computer to do a lot of this stuff because you don't want to have mm-hmm. to sit there and for every attack figure out, you know, do co- you know, high, <laughs> you have to do calculus in order to figure out what's going on. I mean, second edition with Thacko was sort of the same way. That one I do know about. And Thacko was a nightmare. Because you're just, you know, you were all, it just wasn't intuitive. So I think that this gets you in, allows you to do a framework for storytelling instead of a game system on your tabletop. You know, I think mm-hmm. that they finally realized, look, we're never going to be able to compete with, you know, a World of Warcraft that's got a, you know, a server back there doing thousands of rolls a second, you know. You just don't do that on your tabletop. And with that you have, you know, it's funny, we all talk, you know, a lot of these games, people go, oh, well, it's just button smashing. Well, you've got 12 different buttons to smash. Well, yeah, it's really easy when you're hitting the one button and literally in the background, all these calculations are happening. I mean, heck, I get crazy when I'm just like, so, okay, I need to add a smite to this and he's undead and I've got great weapon master. So I rolled a one. Now I, I can re-roll all those ones. Wait, no, but it, because of this, it's ones and twos. And, you know, you, you have to allow, you don't want those mechanics to get in the way. And I think in character creation, that becomes a, a big a big plus on D&D is that you can either take it or leave it. and It'll work. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, character creation being the first intro that people are getting to a system to having mechanics not get in the way can be a really big um, a really big plus for a system because you're not bogged down in, in learning those things before you've even had a chance to kind of put them toward their practical applications. Yeah, and, and speaking of mechanics, like how does the mechanics of creating a character in Dungeons & Dragons kind of lead to... Uh, the proper feel of getting into the mood to play this fantasy role playing game. Um, is there is there any like specific mechanics that just kind of stick out as like, well, this this is getting me into the mindset of this world and this character. I think if you're really doing it like the 
like going through step by step inside of the player's handbook, I think, and it's written in a way that you like your character develops more depth because you're reading the words that are on those pages. I mean, with the idea, you mean even the small amount that we were reading that defined the ages that we chose, you know, and, and like the understanding behind those ages, you mean while. And one of our dwarves is only 40 and one is almost 300, like the amount of difference in just pure life seen. But then that's only because we were dwarves. You know, and if we both chose to be human, then everything about what we're the way we could approach those characters changes. And then when you decide to be a folk hero and how it describes that, or when you decide to be a cleric and how it describes that. And so I think you're, you're, almost force fed. I mean, I don't want to say force fed, but like spoon fed in a way, like just all the ideas that you could probably want to come up with just with the lore that's just built into Dungeons and Dragons. And it seems like when you start out creating the character from step one, you're going just kind of pure numbers. You're rolling attributes. You get a series of six numbers and they don't really mean much until you start picking the, the meat and potatoes, the the, the race and the class, and that's when you are actually starting to delve into who am I creating in terms of what they were born as and what they aspired to become with their life. Yeah, I would say that it kind of eases you into being immersed in your character. So you start out with just this block of numbers, and then by the time we were done, we had kind of come up with our stories and made these full whole characters um that were complete people and so it it really kind of moved you along that process so that by the end the things that you were picking were much more narrative rather than uh, mechanical or statistical which i think is a good a good way to get people into being ready to actually start playing in that world for sure yeah it really lets you uh Figure out who you are. Yeah, like I was talking about those layers where it's just, you again, you just start building that, okay, who really is this person? What's defining them? Do you think that the process does a good job of setting up a player's expectations for playing within the system? Do you think it gives them a good idea of what playing this game is going to be like? I would say so. I mean, certainly, I mean, for casters, absolutely. I think maybe a little less less for martial classes, but certainly for casters. Uh, one, I mean, it's also the thing that most often will overwhelm a new player is suddenly you have get hit with that spell list. And it, wait, I've got to. I get how many, and when do I get to recharge them or change them? Or wait, I choose this, and then I'm stuck. And you know, there's a lot of that type idea. Um, so I'm not. I, I would say, <laughs> you know. You don't know what you've gotten yourself into now until that first set of goblins show up at level one, right? And, and you see, <laughs> and you all suddenly like, you know, you see your twelve hit points or ten hit points, and they hit you for four, and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> uh, well, this was fun. Yeah. <laughs> We're dead yeah. now. Time to roll up a new character. Let's go through it from the beginning. Yep. Back and to the top. Click random character. Three strength. Seven dexterity or seventeen dexterity. <laughs> yep. Oh man, I. I think it does a pretty good job of setting the expectations. That said, I think if the game you're intending to run or going to be in falls outside of kind of the more typical fantasy tropes, maybe it doesn't as much. Um, you know, again, Turn Cloaks being a great example of a very low fantasy version of what D&D could be in the world of Penumbra. Did I get it right? I think I did. Um <laughs> And so I think you could be set up to understand things in a way that aren't going to be your specific game. But like I said, in terms of traditional fantasy, you're definitely going to be ready by the time you set up a character. So you think it probably adds then to the the character immersion as you go through the process of creating the character? It helps you get into uh, their sort of skin by the time you want to start playing? I think it does as long as you're going through the traits portion and choosing bonds and flaws and things like that, because I think it's really the first time in D&D that I can think of that 
kind of goes along the idea of that cipher system sentence. Yeah, I mean, I am a dwarf cleric who has all of these terrible things, potentially, (laughs) um, that I need to follow. And so having those that you can look back to, and then, I mean, not not even just that, but the idea that there is a mechanic built around going to those as a resource and creating inspiration for yourself. And it's also called inspiration. So, I mean, it's just (laughs) clearly this is something they found very important in the design of 5th edition. I would agree. Definitely, because like at the beginning of character creation, it's it's a lot of mechanics and mechanical crunching with a little bit of character development as you're picking your abilities and your equipment and all that sort of stuff. But then, yeah, once you get to those those traits and flaws and everything, it, it really kind of blossoms in, in a way that uh, seems to have been uh, missing from previous editions of D anD. d Was that not a thing in other? <laughs> Neil shaking his head at me. No, <laughs> no. Interesting. I, uh, long, long ago. Um, the other way that you also did stats was just hard rolling one at a time. Mm-hmm. You had three d six, and you would roll your strength. That's what you got. Your dex. That's what you got. And then you would find out what character you wanted to play after. Oh, that. and they had limitations for all the classes. And mm-hmm. I think way back when they even had different uh, stat maximums based on your race, and I think even gender in some cases. Yeah. Well, that sounds like garbage, and I don't <laughs> like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the like percent of characters that were, or slash could be, I think it was like bard or paladin, were under 2% because of the stat requirements that you would have to roll. So yes, 5th edition takes a much more character-focused approach than ever before. Having not played it, I guess I can't really have a full <laughs> full opinion, but I can say that uh, I I like this one and that sounds bad. <laughs> yeah, it was it was aggravating in the old computer games um of uh what is it the late 80s early 90s where when you wanted to create a party with uh mixed gendered characters and now you're completely limited if you choose a female character and you want them to be strong, uh, generally the strength stat was a lot less, uh, which is totally annoying. And when and sexist and rude, yeah, just rude. My my adolescent days of re-rolling every single one of my characters until they were near max stats and everything, uh, sometimes taking like three hours to do so. Um, yeah, that was quite annoying to get over. We've made improvements. Just a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so I want to move on a little bit and discuss more specifically the the characters that we've made um, in our previous episode. And I want to start with talking about group cohesion. Um, mechanically, especially to start, do you think that this is a well-rounded group of characters? Is there any anything in particular that we were missing if this party were to go adventuring how do you think that we would fare i think we did pretty well in terms of kind of character balance Mm -hmm. i guess me well no because the bard can kind of take in take in some of the arcane stuff and it looks like we're just going to fall on two rolls to the bard and hope for the best (laughs) yeah no (laughs) we are melee heavy i mean um you know we don't we don't have a powerhouse caster um mm-hmm. but monk can become uh somewhat of a caster yeah. uh, later on and bards uh depend you know, can do that as well so i mean i think we'd be fine certainly starting as a low level group um i mean heck there's a there's again just as i was saying with the growth piece of all of the classes there's plenty of directions to go and you know with um you know, uh, sacred flame and some of those things. Um, with um, bards, got some range spells as well. Um, you know, currently I'm as a two weapon fighter, but uh, you know, most likely you know, we're going to be up front. Uh, I think it, I think they'd actually do fine. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. We got this. Yeah, because we've got a decent amount of heavy hitters at first level. And that will get you through most of those encounters. Um, 
and we've got uh, somebody that's very uh, charisma based and able to talk their way out of things and uh, from an RP side of thing, a role playing side of thing, we've got a lot of bases covered, I think. Yeah, I mean, bards can do, you know, some some spells and stuff too. So I think I, I when looking at the spells, took some healing and, you know, your basic things that, you know, we would need at a at a baseline. Um, so I, I feel like we would do okay. Very nice. In the system as a whole, how do you think it it plays towards um, developing characters? If you if you just uh, wanted to work on uh, not character advancement, but more uh, developing a character story wise, is, is that something that the the rules of the game lends towards, or is that something that uh, we as players, uh, along with our DM, have to kind of shoehorn into uh, our games playing Dungeons and Dragons? I mean, I think it go either way with most any system. Because I, one of the things I think we people a lot of people say about D and D is, you know, luckily since the community is so large, you can find the group for you. I mean, there are people who, you know, a lot of times in league play, not always, but a lot of times in league play, play it as close to as though you were playing a video game as you can get with a tabletop game. You know, it is very regulated. Uh, the rules are very strictly uh, adhered to, and. You know, you you might be going to a different comic shop every week. You could be literally. I, I I've heard of people who you know map out. They know what adventures and modules they want to play. Figure out who's running that module, and you know, group jump to group jump to advance their character that way in a purely mechanics adventure treasure driven way. You know, like leveling up someone in World of Warcraft or something. Mm -hmm. Um. There also are groups, I mean, like you're saying, Turn Cloaks is very much a, we're telling a story. I have no idea. I mean, I mean, here's a great example. I mean, and who knows when it's going to come in. Alistair got this great sickle, magic item sickle from the other crows. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't used it yet because right now we've got it. We're in the middle of a city. Don't want to get recognized. and. Walking around with a giant sickle <laughs> is, is, <laughs> is really not the, a very subtle way it's to fine. go around. Powerful weapon, you know, for a lot of other, you know, for a lot of people, that would be the I'm carrying the damn weapon no matter what, or you figure out a way to finagle it through. But I mean, so I, you go, it can go either way, I think. You know, all systems, I think, especially in today's environment of critical role and all the other great streamed RPGs have to allow for that piece of storytelling. And, you know, there are systems that don't necessarily capture things like persuasion and you know, persuasion checks and intimidation checks and deception checks and scythe, you know, sleight of hand and things like that. So that, that, that those non-combat related pieces have mechanics around them that can be ignored or used, I think, allow you to have that flexibility for storytelling. Also, to comment on something that I meant to comment on way back in the last episode, you were talking about being <laughs> a bard, but being a joke teller. Mm -hmm. And that, oh, well, you kind of need to have, be a person who can tell those jokes. There was a great uh, video that I forget who did it, whether it was Matt Koval or one of the DMs out there, might have been even Mike Merle's who was talking about D&D &D is there for the person also who's not a great joke teller. That you, there is a mechanic for you to realize I'm not the as charismatic as my characters are supposed to be. And, you know, instead of it being you role-playing, walking up and picking up, you know, the, the elf at the bar, you can go, hey, my character's going to go over and really try to smooth talk this elf at the bar because I want to try to get information out of her. Can, can I roll a charisma check? Can I roll a performance? You know, you know, DM, let me know what I need to roll because I'm either not comfortable doing that or I personally just don't have, you know, the, the right words that my 19 charisma guy would or girl would. Yeah, I think differentiating between player knowledge and character knowledge can be really important in those kinds of situations to say, you know, 
um, especially games that have a lot of like meta plot kind of stuff that you you're sort of like well, my character would know this, but I personally don't know the answer to this. Like I don't know this particular lore, and you can make that role and say, okay, now my character does. Yeah. Um, I think differentiating in those things are important, and I, I feel like you can do that pretty well in in a game like D anD. d So one of the arguments I've I've heard about games like D anD. d though is that it focuses more heavily on like the martial skills and things like that rather than the social skills. Um, there aren't a whole lot of skills for things like etiquette and um, those kinds of things. So how do you, I mean, are you able to blend those in by just saying, okay, I just need a raw charisma check? Or, I mean, how do you, how do you kind of work in the fact that most of your skills are based on how do I hurt someone? when those aren't the kinds of stories that you want to tell. I think a good way goes back to how Tall Squall had used the idea of that when a religion check comes up, the, in some ways, almost the insanity that you would only use intelligence because why? You know, as a paladin or as, you know, the other classes that are deeply seated in the religion that defines them, why wouldn't they be able to get to use though you know, and use those attributes? The idea of etiquette, you know, and let's say we're all at a formal gathering and I use my wisdom to know how I should conduct myself. And I present it that way, whereas someone else may use their intelligence score because they understand kind of I should use this fork for this, I should use this fork for that, or even going to the idea that charisma comes into play and they know how to work a room, no matter what they're doing or how they're doing it. <laughs> and then Constitution, I'll eat it. I, I'll just eat it. I don't, I mean, I've never seen it before, um, but I'll eat it. Uh, Smells yeah, so terrible, idea- but I will stomach it down. <laughs> Here yep. we go. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, you know, people... Like I was saying, you know, and this is where you know, your DM or your player certainly can suggest it as well of saying, you know, I want to do a check because, again, a history check because I know the historical and cultural uh, pieces that would involve this etiquette. Whereas the other piece would be an insight of I can, I'm watching the people around me. And I, you know, I, you know, I'm going to, you know, sort of take my cues from them. Or even on that one, you could have someone say, I want to do a perception and I'm going to look at the person, the lady right across from me and whatever fork she uses, I'm going to use, you know, so you can really use those pieces and put them together. Another one that I have done recently is for specific, particularly weird mixes of tasks is what I do is I have a a double skill check that it is a skill. It's okay. Well, let's go to the etiquette piece. You're by yourself in a room. You've got no one else to play off of. There, everyone's staring at you, waiting for you to make the first move. You know. So then you get into the. I want you to do a history and charisma to to know what's going to work to charm your way out of this situation and not look like and not offend people, you know, and that you, your DCs then are based off of usually it's the same chart, but it's doubled because, you know, and that my charisma was great. My history wasn't so good, but I, you know, I made up for the lacking there here to get me to this through this difficult social situation. So some of it takes the creativity of your DM, but that groundwork is all there. Like I was saying, the DC, Difficulty class. I can go to a chart that's out there that says, "Hey, an everyday an everyday activity is a this." You know, since I'm saying that you're using both of them, let's double that for my everyday activity or hard activity or impossible activity. You know, you, you could have it that if this was super hard, yeah, you've got to roll a sixty or above with the addition of those two pieces, but. You know, you got a bard. You know, at what you know, whatever level we're at. You know, you've got a bard who gets a plus nine on some charisma, a couple good rolls. Getting you know, getting a sixty, you can get there. So, so like the base of the pieces is there, even if you're looking at your character sheet and you're not saying 
you know, I have, I, I, I don't have a skill for that. Yeah. So it's more about like mixing and matching the things that kind of fit together and knowing how to sort of describe what you want to do. And then. Yep. And I've done, this is another one that I've done is for stealth checks in a crowd. You can either use your stealth to hide or you can use your insight to blend in. That's one of the things I let my players do when they are stealthing through crowded areas that they can make the choice. Is there stealth to be truly hidden or is there stealth to blend? And that, so it's, you know, it's a two very different things of, you know, blending in or truly working your way through the shadows and not being seen. Now that also has its own risks, uh, you know, of when you fail or sometimes even succeed. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, the person who chooses to stealth their way through the marketplace might get caught, you know, might because they're not where they're supposed to be, get caught where if they would have just tried to blend in, even though they don't have a bonus on that, you know, the DC would have been, you know, or the consequences would have been different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. That's, uh, I, I never actually thought about uh, applying the the different uh, skills like that and uh no, that that opens a lot of uh a lot of doors that really is just up to your imagination at that point what you can do with the the different skill sets and the different ability modifiers that you have in this game yep and i know we're going deep into like D- dm stuff but i mean i'm i'm the first person as a dm is like sell it to me why you get to use why you want to use perception for to fulfill this to, you know to Tell me why perception works while you're sitting at this dinner table. It's like, because I'm going to watch that lady and what fork she uses. Mm-hmm. I think that's solid advice for players too, though, is to, you know, start thinking about, you know, not just saying, here's here's what I want the results to be, but saying, here's how I go about doing it too. Yeah. And that can kind of lead to more interesting outcomes and interesting consequences too, if you fail. You know, we talked about doing the stealth check two different ways. And when you start describing how you're doing it, it gives your DM a little more opportunity to say, okay, here's what it looks like when it goes wrong right. too, which can can lead to cool things. Absolutely. And back to character creation. And again, this is about knowing your DM and your story of your character. So don't always get into that to be good and think you know, everyone should take stealth because you know, you always have to make stealth tests and that's the quickest way to get caught and everyone dies. <laughs> TPKs happen because of failed stealth checks. You know, <laughs> don't limit yourself that way in your character of what that is. Or you know, uh, now again, you've got to know talk to your DM and that type of idea of you know, hey, can I say that my you know that. I don't want to be the typical rogue who's sneaking in the shadows. Certainly there's going to be cases where it's, you need to sneak in the shadows. But you know, even all the way back to the selection of proficiencies, um, talk to them and say, hey, you know, my guy is the con man. He's a master of disguise. He's a master of I- imitation. And so when he's stealthing, he's all about, you know, I want it to be that he's insight into in this area, in this place, that I I can blend in anywhere, and that makes a great story. You know, a ca- whole character. I mean, I I'm just sitting here mentally building this character in my head already. Of yeah, this you've built like twelve characters while we've yeah, been talking is, over the course. Of this this is a rogue who isn't about skulking in the shadows. This is a rogue about you know he's the cat burglar who bit blends in anywhere. He's the one who you know the guy who walks right into the store. Uh, you know goes and takes a bracelet off the countertop and walks out the door and no one questions him because everyone thinks that he knows what he's doing and he obviously must work there, you know, type idea. Mm-hmm. You know, work with it. Build that character so that it's not just the – the archetypes are great, but this system allows you to really play with them and work with your DM to create that story. Yeah, definitely. I, I like it in the, the Dungeon Master's Guide where it says, you know, if you don't like a rule, just throw it out. Replace it do what you want with it because this is your game to play and if there's something that you think you can do better with your group uh go for it because the only thing that can really happen that's wrong with that is you might try something and it might not work out great well so what just stop doing it that new way then and try something else or go back to the original way things are meant to be yeah, totally. I think as you know, as long as you're having fun, that's 
really the most important part. And there are certainly groups that really enjoy playing by the rules as they're written. And like, that's something that everybody agrees to going into it. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that if that's what you guys feel like you want to do. And that's, you know, something that everybody has agreed upon as a group. Um, There's certainly plenty to work with there. Um, But there's no reason that you have to stick with that if, if you're just not feeling it. Definitely. Take it up a level. Take it up a level. Well, now that we've kind of covered uh, the major discussion of this system, uh, let's get into a discussion about character advancement in Dungeons and Dragons. I know a lot of role-playing games handle character advancement a little bit differently. Um, and I know a lot of people are probably familiar with how Dungeons and Dragons does the character advancement, advancement in terms of experience points and whatnot. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and talk a little bit. How is leveling up handled in this system? Um, what are your thoughts on it? And uh, what sort of things uh, do we have to kind of look out for in terms of uh, planning characters and whatnot? I'm a milestone person myself. Um, both, you know, most of the games I, I, uh, have played in and that I've run do milestone. Um, I tried to do XP, but in a low combat campaign, it gets really difficult, um, because you're trying to numerize, numerize, I don't know if that's the right word. You're trying to put numbers to someone's role playing and they're having fun and, you know, so it gets very odd. Um. And so I switched to Milestone. But on the same note, XP is great. You know, it's a good idea for you, a good way for you to sort of figure out, okay, I, they killed this. It's worth that um, type idea. But again, I think the lesson of D&D is don't let your hands get tied by anything. Um, and, you know, level up as your story dictates. You know, if your party's getting tired of fighting goblins, um, Level them up so you can throw gnolls at them and level them up again so you can throw a dragon at them. You know, I think it's, it's, it's not using the leveling as a story progression is great. If it becomes a hindrance and a grind because, oh, I need to go kill three more kobolds so I can make level three, you know, that's to me not what it's all. I'm not sure if I answered the question, the question right, but there you go. (laughs) No, that's, yeah. So, uh what is exactly can you explain um milestone a, a little bit i mean cuz xp is you know like points for doing things but so milestone ex- milestone leveling is done that at a critic you know, when when a achievement has happened within the story that the party has overcome that usually the entire party levels up at the same time um that uh whatever it might be that you Completed the first arc of a story, made it through this place, traveled from X to Y, you know, whatever it might be. Um, figured out a big mystery or a puzzle. Most anything, any milestone in your story that it makes sense, uh, is you basically the DM declares that you're leveling up. Um, sometimes that can be unsatisfying to people because they don't they want to. You know, they're they're used to seeing that level bar, you know. On their from their video game, uh, move mm-hmm. forward and go up, and uh, so you don't get that feedback. There's not necessarily that feedback loop that you get. Um, so again, it's mm-hmm. something you need to discuss with your DM. But as far as character creation goes, just talking about the levels themselves, I think there is a very nice progression in power of the characters as you go from one to twenty in this game. That there's twenty different little power-ups or changes in your ability level that make you feel like you are getting better and more special. So, Neil, I want to ask you about um, kind of planning ahead for those choices that you're going to have to make later on. Are you, um, is it something that you have to do at character creation? I know there are some systems where it's like, if I want to get to this thing at level 20, I have to have met all of these other prerequisites to get there. Is that something that you know, you need to think about in this system in this particular edition, or is that something that you can kind of just do as you please? It's not quite as much in this system as others, but it is definitely something to keep in mind if 
again, that's the kind of character that you want to build. So then um, another podcast, the uh, Total Party Thrill, they have the character creation forge where they build a very specific idea that's built over all 20 levels. So, I mean, you really do have to have that forethought to say, I want to do this or I want to do that. And it, but you could also have those, those goals be much shorter. Well, I want to be a fifth level barbarian because then I get this. And that totally defines who I am in the same way. I mean, you could just be like, you know, I'm going to take it one level at a time. And when I get here, based on the things I've done up until this point, I'll let that define who I will be as this character. So maybe, you know, and I, what if I fall super into not really being a cleric, but also like learning some martial skills? Because maybe I want to help my nephew out. So then I take a level of fighter as well. I mean, it's all can kind of play back and forth on top of it, on top of itself, depending on what character you want to build. Yeah, because I know in previous editions of Dungeons and Dragons, uh, especially the likes of uh, three five, you had to almost know where your character was going if you were going to be working on your character advancement as you were playing, since so many different things stacked on top of everything else. Whereas if you got to level twenty and you were just playing it level by level, you might miss out on the really super sweet final feat of whatever class you're playing because you didn't take this other thing at level two and which would have progressively led your way towards okay so now that i have that i can get these things at level four and six and then i can get this other thing at level 10 and so on and so on um to lead you to this the final culmination of uh superior power abilities i guess Whereas this edition seems to be more along the lines of, you know, it doesn't really matter because there's not as many prerequisites out there. And if you miss it at level four, you could probably pick it up at level eight. Does that sound kind of kind of accurate to fifth edition? I would agree. I Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it huh, geez, I was having a discussion with someone about um, 3.5. And I made a joke that like it was funny because it was way too true of like, OK, cool. You've made your 3.5 character. Now, don't forget to attach your bibliography. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, like that's true. Like I need to know as a DM, like all the 10 books you used to create that so that I know like where you got this information and how it's all like folding together. Yeah, definitely. Because in, in fifth edition, you could create a class and a character out of uh, totally different books from the player's handbook. And it doesn't exactly matter that you did that because it's all kind of running on the same sort of back end. Everything's going to be kind of similar and you don't have to worry about these crazy calculations that are totally going to break your game. My other question about leveling up and advancing in the system is whether it feels um, sort of continually progressive. I know there are some systems where, you know, your first couple levels, it feels like it takes a while to sort of get going, or there are other ones that the jump from the first level to the second level is huge, and then, you know, it kind of peters off after that. Does it feel like you're continually moving forward, or are there jumps that are bigger than others? Is it balanced that way? I know for me personally, I feel that there are tiers and I, it's actually kind of, it's loosely described in some of the text, but I, I know the first big jump for me, at least in terms of power is fifth, yeah, uh, level five. I mean, that's where you get the third level spells and those are some game changers. That first fireball changes <laughs> how everything goes from then on. <laughs> I mean, yeah, for martial folks, you get that extra attack. So it's, it does. Everything changes at level three. I'm sorry, level five. <laughs> sorry. It's, <laughs> sorry. It's, I mean, does it still feel like each level, though, you're getting something out of it, even if you get these bigger things at these, like, sort of, I mean, I don't want to say milestones, because that's, you know, something different that we just talked about, and I don't want to be confusing. <laughs> but, like, do you have, I mean, even if there are these, you know, sort of defined points where you get better things, there are still 
you still kind of get stuff along the way. I, I mean, I think so. I think everyone gets, you know, there's certainly some lackluster levels out there for different classes, but I think there's always something that makes you feel at least a little like, you know, that you're, you're progressing and moving forward. I mean, I, I can't complain. Yeah. Momentum. <laughs> Inertia. Yeah. Yeah, Cause I think in fifth edition, they've got a chart at the beginning of every single character class. They do. That says level one, you get this level two, you get this and so on and so forth. And every single level has something aside from you get extra hit points, which is really nice. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with hit points. Oh, no. <laughs> Especially if you are a barbarian. We could all use more of those. <laughs> I think that was a pretty good uh, wrap-up for uh, character advancement in Dungeons & Dragons. Um, so, you guys, thank you both so much for having joined us for our very first character creation episode. Woo! Yay! Yeah, and it, it was uh, definitely a thrill to have you both on here and... Uh, we're very excited, uh, to get this out there for everybody to hear. Um, could you guys go ahead and, uh, remind us again where we can find you on social media, uh, beginning with Tall Squall. I am Tall Squall. You can, best way to find me and all the different things and projects that I do is through my Twitter. You can go find me at Tall Squall and my pinned tweet has links to all the different things that I do out there. And, uh, do uh, let me know that you found me uh, through this podcast when you uh, come and find me at other places. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and Neil. Yep. You can head over to at DMS underscore block. That's at DMS block where you can find pretty much everything I do through there. And again, you can also head over to the struggle is com and check out the fifth edition stuff that I'm making over there. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody that is out there for tuning in. We will see you next time. Character Creation Cast is a production of the Block Party Podcast Network and can be found at www.blockpartypodcastnetwork.com slash character creation cast. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, our guests, some of our character sheets, and other shows on the network. Character Creation Cast can be found on Twitter at CreationCast. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter at Lord Neptune. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game system used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you like the game systems discussed and wish to purchase them, links to the products can be found in the show notes. Thanks for joining us, and remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation, so go out there and create some amazing people. We will see you next time. So, are we, are we going on to when are we going to hit history? Because I'm terrified of that one. I can cover that quickly if if you guys don't mind. Uh, cause Go I've got, for it. Yeah, I got I... all the facts and everything. He read the Wikipedia before Ooh, we started you. the podcast. I did. So. I apologize, dude. That's being prepared. <laughs> um, looks like we got one more question uh, for all you guys. There's this Gary guy. <laughs> there was a basement and this guy named Gary. I don't know. <laughs> You gotta love George Foreman, who named all of his five sons George Foreman. How does that, like, I don't... So they were all George Foreman, two through six, and they all had nicknames to differentiate, but on their birth certificates, it is George Foreman, the father, and then George Foreman, the second, through the sixth.
but they're not like really the sixth because they're not a different generation. Like that's not how that works. Oh no, that's totally how it works. I did a ton of research because my son is the third. <laughs> totally how it can work. <laughs> you would be surprised. But if you had another kid, you would not name him the fourth. I have threatened it, but no, my wife will not do that. <laughs> that kind of that kind of sounds like uh, my life in real life. I get so hyper focused on something. Nobody can really talk me out of what I'm doing. <laughs> what what what, what, what did you say? I've been talking <laughs> to you for twenty minutes. You've just been on the computer doing your podcast stuff. Just nodding. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my my brain just stopped working for a second. I'm thinking about dad jokes. You know, I I kind of I, I like uh, the. Uh, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, I can totally see kind of almost like this uh, uh, what's his name? The great, uh, is it Euro? Uh, no, the Firebender Uncle. Uh, oh, man, oh man, this is terrible. But anyway, uh, Uncle Iroh. It's 12. Not as bad as I thought. Oh no. <laughs> Do you get Fate a three? A cruel mistress. No. <laughs> That's a six. <laughs> Yahtzee. <laughs> Oh, All one. No, I'm bad at math. That's a seven. Slightly better. <laughs> I know. Slightly better. Oh, no. That's an 11. A temple of Lothanir. Lothan- Lothander. Lothander? How do you pronounce that? I think it's Lothander. Yeah. I don't know. You're the acolyte of Lothander. I think that however you pronounce it is technically correct. And then the rest of us have to. <laughs> it's <laughs> Lothander. Oh, you. You're the expert here. <laughs> You just, <laughs> keep, <laughs> say- <laughs> you just keep saying it wrong so he looked dumb when other people talk to him. He has an int of eight, so he might mispronounce it all the time. <laughs> La- who do I worship? La- Lothan? Lothan? Okay. <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> Character creation cast. We create characters, but we do not play them. <laughs> no. Nope. That's it. <laughs> Tosqual, you don't even need to choose your level with this random thing. I'm now, I have a random... Dragonborn barbarian who is sixth level. What? Oh, but dude, I thought you had to always choose a level. I uh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, look at that. You can just hit the button. Damn, look at. Let's see what we got. What do we got? What's the randomizer give me? View character sheet. Dur, dur, dur. Marvrin, a level thirteen Aarakocra cleric with a seventeen wisdom. That, oh, dude, check out these stats. 15 strength, 14 dexterity, 16 constitution, 16 intelligence, 17 wisdom. Powerhouse. Charisma is nine. <laughs> he's an Arakakra, you know. Maybe he's, you know, something. Well, I'd have to go with a weird bird or something. Uh, what's his domain? Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, absolutely. That'd be awesome. He's a dodo bird. Man, he's a life cleric, too. 